What say of it? What say conscience grim? That specter in my path. Chamberlain's Ferronito. Let me call myself, for the present, William Wilson. Will I am Wilson. The fair page now lying before me now need not be solely with my real appellation. This has been already too much an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the desiccation of my race. To the uttermost regions of the globe have not the indignant winds brooded its unparalleled infamy? Oh. Outcast of all outcasts, most abandoned. To the earth art thou not forever dead? To its honors, its, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations? And a cloud dense. Dismal and limitless? Does it not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven? I would not, if I could, here or today, embody a record of my later years' unspeakable misery, an unpardonable crime. This epic, these later years, took unto themselves a sudden elevation in turpitude, whose origin alone it is my present purpose to assign. Men usually grow base by degrees. For me, in an instant, all virtue dropped bodily as a mantle from comparatively trivial wickedness I have passed with the stride of a giant into more than the enormities of an allied gabouts. What chance, what one event brought this evil thing to pass? Bear with me while I relate. Death approaches in the shadow which foreruns him has thrown a softening influence over my spirit. I long in passing through the dim valley for the sympathy I nearly said that for the pity of my fellow men. I would not fain to have them believe I have been, in some measure, the slave of circumstances behind, beyond human control. I would wish them to seek out for me, in the details I'm about to give, some little oasis of fatality amid a wilderness of error. I would have them allow what they cannot refrain from allowing, that although temptation had may have erewhile while existed as great, man was never thus, at least tempted before, certainly never thus fell. And is it therefore that he has never thus suffered? Have I not indeed been living in a dream? Am I not now dying a victim to the horror and the mystery of the wildness of all sublunary visions? I am a descendant of a race whose imaginative and easily excitable temperament has all, at all times rendered them remarkable, and in my earliest infancy I gave evidence of having a fully inherited the family character. As I advanced in years, it was more strongly developed, becoming, for more reasons, many reasons, a cause of serious disquietude to my friends and a positive injury to myself.
I grew self-willed, addicted to the wildest caprices, and a prey to the most ungovernable passions. Weak-minded and beset with constitutional infirm infirmities, akin to my own, my parents could do little but to check the evil propensities which distinguish me. Some feeble and ill-directed efforts resulted in complete failure on their part, and of course in total triumph on mine. Thenceforward, my voice was a household law, and in an age when few children have abandoned their leading strings, I was left to the guidance of my own will and became in all but name the master of my own actions. My earliest recollections of a school life are connected with a large rambling Elizabethan house in a misty looking village of England where were a vast number of gigantic and gnarled trees. And where all the houses were excessively ancient. In truth, it was a dreamlike and spirit-soothing place, that venerable old town. At this moment in fancy, I feel the, the refreshing chilliness of its deep shadow, deeply shadowed avenues, inhale the fragrance of its thousand shrubberies, and thrill anew with undefinable delight at the deep hollow note of the church bell breaking each hour with sullen and sudden roar upon the stillness of the dusky atmosphere in which the fretted gothic steeple lay embedded in his sleep. It gives me perhaps as much a pleasure as I can now in any manner experience to dwell upon minute recollections of the school and its concerns. Steeped in misery as I am, misery, alas, only too real, I shall be pardoned for seeking relief, however si slight and temporary, in the weakness of a few rambling details. These, moreover, utterly, utterly trivial and even ridiculous in themselves, assume to my fancy adventitious importance as connected with the period and a locality with when and where I recognized the first ambiguous munitions of the destiny with which afterward so fully overshadowed me. Let me then remember the house, as I have said, was old and irregular. The grounds were extensive in a high and solid brick wall topped with a bed of mortar and broken glass encompassed the whole. This prison-like rampart formed the limit of our domain. Beyond it we saw it thrice a week. Once every Saturday afternoon, when attended by two ushers, we were permitted, permitted to take brief walks in a body through some of the neighboring fields. And twice during Sunday, when we were paraded in the same formal matter of the morning and evening service of one of the church in the one church of the village. Of this church, the principal of our school was pastor. With how deep a spirit of wonder and perplexity was I wont to regard him from our remote pew in the gallery, as with step solemn and slow, he ascended the pulpit. This reverend man, with the countenance so demurely to benign, with robes so glossy and so clearly flowing, with wigs so minutely powdered, so rigid and so vast, could this be he who of late, with sour visage and snuffy habiliments, administered pharaoh in hand the draconian laws of the academy? Oh, gigantic paradox, too utterly monstrous for solution.
At an angle of this ponderous wall frowned a more ponderous gate. It was riveted and studded with iron bolts and surmounted with jagged iron spikes. What impressions of deep awe did we inspire? Did inspire did? It was never open save for the three periodical ingressions and ingressions already mentioned. Then, in every creak of its mighty hinges, we found a plentitude of mystery, a world of matter for a solemn remark, or for more solemn meditation. The extensive enclosure was irregular in form, having many capacious recesses. Of these, three or four of those largely constituted the playground. It was level and covered with fine hard gravel. I well remember it had no trees, nor benches, nor anything similar within it. Of course, it was in the rear of the house. In front lay a small parterre planted with box and other shrub. But through this sacred division, we passed only upon rare occasions indeed. Such as an advent, a first advent to school, or first or final departure from thence. Or perhaps when a parent or friend having called for us, we joyfully took home, our way home for the Christmas or midsummer holidays. But the house, how quaint an old building was this, to me, how veritably a palace of enchantment. There was really no end to its windings, to its incomprehensible subdivisions. It was difficult at any given time to say which, with certainty, upon which of its two stories one happened to be. From each room to every other there were sure to be found three or four steps in either an ascent or descent. Then the latter branches were innumerable, inconceivable. And so we're turning in upon ourselves themselves that our most exact ideas in regard to the whole mansion were not very far from, different from those which we have pondered upon infinity during the five the first the five years of my residence here I was never able to ascertain with precision in what remote locality little lay the little sleeping apartment assigned to myself and some 18 or 20 other scholars. The schoolroom was the largest in the house. I could not help thinking in the world. It was very long and narrow and dismally small with pointed gothic windows and a ceiling of oak. In a remote and terror inspiring angle was a square enclosure of eight or ten feet comprising the sanctum, quote unquote, during hours of our principal, the Reverend Dr. Bransby. It was a solid structure with massy door, sooner than open, which in the absence of the domine, we would all have willingly perished by the hard and cruel punishment. The pian forte et dure. In other angles, we were there were two other box, similar boxes, far less reverenced indeed, but still greatly matters of all. One of these was the pulpit of the classical usher, one of the English and mathematical. Interspersed about the room, crossing and recrossing in endless irregularity were innumerable benches and desks, black, ancient, and time-worn, piled desperately with much but some books, and so beseamed with initial letters, names at length, grotesque figures, and other multiplied efforts of the knife, as to have entirely lost what little of original form it might have been their portion in days long departed. A huge bucket of water with stood at one extremity of the room and a clock of stupendous dimensions at the other.